Okay, guys. Okay, guys, here we are. Here is the Fight Property Show this morning. We are going to be talking about buy to let of pensions, uh, which has the profit, the freedom, and the security that's actually right for you. So it's the most important point. It's buy to let property or it's, you know, it's, uh, it's pensions. Which is best? Which performs best? Which is going to match your criteria? All the rest of it. So be, being a landlord, guys, um, might stay still pay better than a pension. And that was the resting headline in the Telegraph that caught the attention lately. Uh, pensions have certainly been squeezed with workplace pension pots shrinking and inflation eating into returns. Meanwhile, buy to let regularly portrayed in the press is no longer viable, <laughs> uh, despite research from Hamptons revealing that the average yield from buy to let is between 6% is 50% um, higher than the actual 4% of the pension returns. Now, yeah. uh, this morning, for the people on TikTok and Instagram, we've got Richard and Karen on the actual on our um, YouTube channel, so just so you know that. Uh, chip in if you want, ask any questions if you want as well. What's your opinion on buy to let investments uh, or pensions? Which one's better for you? Uh, please feel free to comment as well on the Facebook pages, Twitter, um, LinkedIn, and also YouTube as well. So we're streaming it on multiple channels live at this point in time. Um, and uh, what do you think, Richard? You know, buy to let pensions, initial gut reaction. Um, obviously, straight to buy to let, but then I think really a combination of both. I think I mean I get so many people that come to me, uh, and their pensions just aren't what they expected them to be, or aren't going to be what they expected to be, yeah. um, and that's why they've come to the conclusion that right, I'm going to look at the buy to let option um, to build up their pensions and make them feel more secure when they get to that point in life. Because yeah. I mean, it, it scares a lot of people when people work yeah. hard and think they've got a pension there to tide them over when they're in the later years and in reality it's, it's not going to be that um so yeah the buy to let option is definitely definitely still a viable option uh, despite what the press says gut reaction from your point of view ken i mean to me the pension is always something that seems a bit uncertain at my age when obviously pension ages are rising <clears throat> excuse me obviously you're going to have to be older to get be entitled to your pension now and yeah. a buy to let, I feel, just gives you a bit more freedom for that as well. Obviously, you know what we're doing with buy to let. So it just it seems like it's good to have your both options if it's something that you are able to do. Yeah. I mean, the key is here, is who, do you, who do you start listening to if you want to start planning for your future? I think that's where the key comes down to. There's no replacement for uh, hearing things straight from the horse's mouth. Definitely. Um, so. We've actually put together some information for everybody and put the thoughts of our landlords um, are, and why they choose buy to let. Um, I've also included some useful facts that don't always make the headlines. So you can see what feels right for you. Um, th I mean, this is this is what this show is all about this week. Um, it's constituting it, it doesn't constitute financial advice, remember. We are yeah. not advising anybody what to do. We're not financial advisors, we're not nothing. This is just our general opinion on how we see buy to let and how we see pensions. You need to seek uh, professional financial advice from advisors that are qualified to do this. Um, but, you know, I kind of have, I kind of have a wee bit of track record in this. Yeah. <laughs> just gonna say, you say, you were saying there about who, who do you listen to? Uh, I think it's always wise to listen to people who have had the experience, who are obviously uh, in the process of doing that or, or further down the journey doing that, like yourself, Jim, and others. Um, but I, it's it's always good to remember that it's not financial advice and if really sit down with a financial advisor and go through things properly in any instance. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's important to know that if, if you're on the fence about becoming a landlord or whether to expand or offload your lettings portfolio, um, we'll hope you'll give you some clarity in 2023, you know, in, in terms of what we're doing. I mean, more tenants are actually chasing fewer homes at this point in time. That's one of the key things. It's no secret that rents are actually soaring uh, with rises of 20% or more in some of the areas last year, accompanied by record high demand. For several reasons, the rental market is unlikely to cool down anytime soon. Now, this is the reasons why many landlords who focus on short-term yields have actually sold up now because uh, the price of the property has actually gone up significantly in comparison so therefore, they're, they're, they're taking the money and running. So they're creating a, a huge shortfall of rental property and massive competition for tenants. E economic uncertainty as well and interest rate rises have convinced more buyers to keep renting for longer, fueling further 
demand. And the final one for me is probably nowhere near enough. New housing has been built or planned. Um, and the chances are anything changing significantly in the foreseeable future look pretty slim. I mean, we've I've looked at this time and time again, haven't I? You know, the the, the Scottish market, for example, and the English market. Okay, the, the UK uh, English economy should be um, building overall in the UK two hundred seventy five thousand houses every single year to keep up with demand. Now, twenty five thousand houses are in Scotland as a result of that because it usually works on a one to ten proportion because we're about six million, they're about sixty million in terms of population. So equally, that's how it's kind of split. Now, if you can't, I've I've, I've tracked the last. 10 years or the last 15 years in terms of the, the Scottish housing market and the UK housing market, and they've, not, they've hit nowhere near the target they were actually after in order to just keep up with demand. Now, when a government comes out and says, oh, that's great, we're going to build another 110,000 uh, social and affordable housings over the next 10 years to accommodate for the extra, it's like, okay, so if you can't build the 25,000 or the 250,000 that you were trying to do in the first place, how on earth are you going to try and build another 10,000 every year. Yeah. They're not going to do it. It's impossible, isn't it? It's just, it's just a sound bite. So there's no way they're, they're going to be able to keep up with the amount of house building that's required. We simply don't have the skills or resources in our workforce. We are sitting with a full employment. We're sitting at about 3.6% unemployment level. That is a record low unemployment level. We have got more, more jobs than there is actually people looking for jobs at this point in time. And yeah. for anybody out there that's going to say anything different, that's not going to change in the foreseeable future pretty quick because there's no signs in the, on the horizon to suggest that the economy is going to take a, a huge financial dip unless you can tell me otherwise. So in the short term, rental market, the rental market needs more homes and the door is wide open for private landlords to fill this gap. And when you provide high quality accommodation, you can be sure of constant demand every single time, generating the highest possible rent from the best tenants. Yeah, I mean, it's and that's, what, that's what we've seen. Yeah. It's how I first started out, Richard. You know, the first thing I did when I started out, I took properties from areas that, you know, people would otherwise not generally go for as mainstream. And then I just made them pristine inside. So when everybody walked in the door, they just looked at them and went, wow, I could see myself staying here straight away. And and because you had done so much inside, it just it just ticked every single box, and you would have a high occupancy rate as a result of that. And therefore, if you've got a high occupancy rate and you've got a good a good rental level, and um, then you've got no voids, therefore you're maximising the returns. And the other controllable thing that you need to look after is the interest rate level as well. And especially if you can fix that at a rate that is tolerable, then that's fine as well. And then when you take into account things like um, for example, rent rent controls, possibly. Yeah. Possibly rent controls might be on the horizon, but th that shouldn't put you off at this point in time, purely for the fact that you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, you know, this is like, oh, I think it's going to happen, so I'm not going to do it. Uh, newsflash, most things don't happen. It's very, very rare. They just say that in order to put people off, to stop them investing in the market. Um, so the, the key here is to make sure you're covered and make sure risk is minimised, and that's the most important point. What's your thoughts on this, Richard? You know, the yeah. more, more tenants are chasing fewer homes. Oh, we've, I mean, we've seen, because of obviously the shortage in housing and, and the high demands that we've seen lately, then in areas, like you say, Jim, areas that usually tenants maybe wouldn't be picking up properties, landlords are doing them at a better standard. And, I mean, Karen, we'll see it all the time, but we see in areas that we've maybe in the past had... Um, a longer t period where we've had to fill a property, we're getting people lining up for it, and it's like, and it's good quality tenants. Obviously, that goes hand in hand with the fact that the property has finished to a better standard, um, and it makes all the difference. I mean, there's certain streets and things that used to struggle before, uh, and once you walk in and see a pristine property finished to a good standard, it takes that away, and it's like, really, is the area that bad when the property is that good? Um, yeah, and yeah. Karen, I'm it sure. Works like, hand in hand as well, because obviously, if you're putting out that good quality of property you're attracting in a better quality of tenant at the same time as well which then brings up the area yeah. rather than bad properties not yeah. so great tenants and keeping it at that standard so it's good we have had a lot of properties just now that have had refurbishments done to them or a lot of work and it's brought in better tenants that have also yeah. stayed for longer as well because they have mm -hmm. this nice property mm -hmm. 
yeah, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, streets that have had bad rep in the past, and some people will inquire and think no, or, or they'll inquire and we will say, oh, what about this one? And they'll be like, no, 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 and be like, well, really, it's not like that anymore. Um, and that that's that's how you regenerate areas and and certain streets and things and places. I lived in that street. That's why. That's why I know it's no like. I'm not just talking about that street in particular. There's other. There's other. There's other streets and places that it's happening in. Uh, but that's a prime example. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 do your research. I mean, you know, you'll often have people getting put off by certain streets and certain areas. But do your research. Actually, go and live in there for a while. You know, yeah. you can find a rental for you know, or you can get you can get a spare room for a couple of weeks and find out what it's like and actually see what the area is actually like. Um, You'll, you'll be pleasantly surprised. It's just more people like to talk negative about an area than than it actually is. Um, mm -hmm. And often the area is, is very, very nice. Uh, and especially if it's if, if it's an up and coming area. Um, look at all the places in, Eng in, in, in England and in London, especially. You know, look at all the places in London, you know, have come up, been up and coming areas and they've gone to astronomical heights in terms of property investment, in terms of prices of houses as well and apartments. And it's purely for the fact that some people had the foresight to see it coming. Some people had the foresight to see where the next growth area was. And yeah. because of our limiting amount of stock in the UK, we have the we have the least amount of houses per thousand head of population in, in almost in the whole of the world. You know, in, in the developed world. Yeah. Um, and, and that, that and it's probably because we're on an island, that's one of the ones, but but that shouldn't stop us anyway, because you look out in the countryside, there's plenty of space for to put houses. Got a lot of room there. Planning's got a lot of restrictions here and infrastructure that goes along with it. Like, for example, you have to put health centres up, you have to put uh, more um, more education on and facilities on. You, you know, you have to put all these things in place um, as you're growing um, the, the housing market and you have more people coming into an area. Uh, and then you have to create, obviously, more jobs because um, you don't really just want to have a dorm. Um, but some places are actually end up being dorms. Um, and I mean, they're just housing areas for the main town centres. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, a classic example of that is probably Kennaway. You know, Kennaway mm -hmm. is a dorm, really, for leaving. Um, and, and it has, yeah, it has basic shopping facilities. It has a bus centre, a bus station, and it has the um, the main shopping facilities out there. But but apart from that, it's mainly a housing area. And uh, the focal point is actually the leaving mouth area. And similar situations work with St Andrews, similar situations work with Anstruther, and um, similar situations work with uh, Glenrothes and also Kakodi and Dunfermline. So you know all the main areas, but everything else round about that becomes the dorms, in other words, the housing areas for the main the main facilities that are on offer. Yeah, I've never heard of that term, but that, that makes sense to understand that. Yeah, it's, uh, I heard it years ago from someone um, when they were talking about in, in politics and they were saying, you know, that's what happens really. Um, and that's why they don't sometimes want to connect um, areas um, um, uh, with, with, you know, with, with housing spreading. Uh, classic example mm -hmm. is leaving is almost getting on to uh, Windigates now. Um, yeah, so at what point, up and yeah, and at what point will that happen? And, and I don't think it will for that very reason because they don't want that to become part of that area. They need to have some sort of separation at, at, at some point in time. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk about, you know, money needs and, yeah. and to grow I mean, after you retire? I mean, what, what, what's your thoughts on that, Richard? Yeah, I mean, I mentioned at the start that I have a lot of people coming to me who have got their pension pots coming up or, or do you know what I mean? And they're coming to that realisation where... Yeah. It's not going to be. It's not going to come to fruition as they expected, and and basically your money needs to grow after you retire as well. Um, and as, and we've seen how high inflation can reduce the value of your savings. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you want to maintain a rewarding and comfortable lifestyle in later life, your money needs to keep working to stay ahead of the cost of living, and that's ever so apparent um, over the last uh, year uh, and at, as, at, at present, obviously as well. So well, does that, it grab that concept though about the fact that when you say your money needs to keep working? I mean, mm -hmm. what do we mean by that? Um, so let me just explain that what yeah, we mean okay. by money keeps working. In other words, if you leave a hundred pounds in the bank and inflation is at 10 percent, by the time you get to the end of the year, that hundred pounds will only be able to buy probably about 90 pounds worth of goods. Yeah. At, at what was at the start of the year? So, classic example of that is a pint of milk, maybe a pint of milk was a pound. Um, so by the end of the year, you'll only get nine tenths of a pint of milk by the end of the year because inflation, uh, you'll only be able to buy that with the same pound that you had yeah. um, because inflation's gone up by about 10%. So that's how if you leave your money doing nothing, 
it will just basically it will just devalue over time. This is why the government's adamant they want to get inflation down because inflation is the as a destructor for for um, for earnings and also for savings and wealth. But see, I love inflation because inflation is a destructor for debt as well. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of people don't really understand the com the concept of inflation, so it's good to kind of just explain it, not in layman terms as such, but just to kind of break it down to make people understand how it actually works and how it affects your money. Um, yeah. Well, look at you know when I talked about and just to just to cover the wee bit about debt, you know the inflation's yeah. a destructor for debt because basically, if you've got a mortgage on a house, the mortgage is at a certain value. While your house moves up in value, the mortgage stays the same value. Therefore, the appreciation that you're getting in between the equity you're building is is wealth, and um, but also the fact that 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 money you originally spent on that house in the first place, which is the debt, you're servicing that by paying interest. But if the interest level is less than inflation, you're actually getting a bonus. Yeah. Because the debt is decreasing with what it can purchase uh, by 10%, for example. And if you're paying a mortgage of, say, 5% on it, then you're actually up 5% every single year that debt stays in place while you're going. Now, I'm not recommending it as a way to make money because <laughs> it's not clearly, unless so, you're investing in your future, unless you're investing in what you need to do in the future. Um, in other words, if you're making if you're making ten percent on your if you're making ten percent on your money, and the bank is charging you five percent on your money, then you're clearing a differential of five percent every single time on the bank's money. So that's how you make money, and that's how every business business operates. It's using the existing capital employed. To, to deliver a return based on the effort they, they put into their service and goods that they're, that they're providing. Yeah, we spoke about that the other day, Jim, uh, on, the, on the show. But um, yeah, but yeah there, there are some very basic things to remember about your income um, and retirement. Uh, the first day when your pension reaches its maturity date, um, it's, it's obviously decision time. You could leave it alone um, if you don't need it. And I, I know people that have done that, obviously, um, who are in that fortunate position. You could take a, a cash lump sum, uh, which is around about the, the first 25%, which is tax free. Uh, or you could convert it to another investment like shares um, or annuities. Uh, Jim, this is something that I'm not overly familiar with. Obviously, we talk about buy to lets and pensions. Yeah. Everybody kind of yeah. has at least an idea of what both of those things are. Annuities, yeah. can you explain that one? So an annuity is what happens is when you build a pension pot. So in other words, when you put money into savings and it returns over the years and the government puts money in as well with the tax that you're getting back on it, it builds up in wealth over a period of time. But when it becomes when it comes to maturity, the pension um, you then draw it down. Now, today, what you can do is you can you can draw it down and you can actually just call it off when you want it now. But you're taxed on the income when it when you call it off. In other words, you can take 25% out. You know, that's the rule of thumb, tax-free. So if you had a £200,000 pension and you took out 25% tax-free, you can get 50 grand tax-free straight away. But the other 150000 every time you draw it down, will be part of your normal mainstream income. OK, so that's one method that you can do today. George Osborne actually allowed that to happen. But before, you used to be forced to buy an annuity. So an annuity was you had to go to a pension company and they said, I tell you what, for every for every £100,000 you give us from your pension and, and money, we will give you £6,000 a year in income for that every 100000 So you would buy that annuity. And it would guarantee you an income every single year based on what the investment houses were forecasting. But rates of return were so low, Kevin, that that's why that's why the government actually decided to to say that you know this is ridiculous. You're getting forced to buy something, and maybe isn't it really getting the return you want. So we need to give you a lot more flexibility and a lot more options about what you do with your pension when it finally matures. And that's why they said that you can you can do hey you can go and put it all on black tomorrow. <laughs> the casino. Genuinely, that was I think that was actually the reason that you know one of the puns that was actually said by the Chancellor. You could just go down and put it all on black or red at the casino. And that's you lost a lot. And that was the that was the worry of the pensions um and the fact that some people might actually do that. And then the state would be left with a huge obligation to provide, to provide that person with a, a pension credit, you know. Um I, I, it's never happened. Because anybody that's built a pension over a period of time like that. Is going to have the common sense to actually say, I'm not, to just blow it. I'm, not going to go, "I'm not going to go down to the casino and put it all in red or black." Um, that's that's just stupid. 
Um, so if you want to go out and buy a car, you know, uh, you're, because you've got your your old age midlife crisis or old age crisis, um, <laughs> midlife crisis. Uh, <laughs> or your fifth midlife crisis or whatever it is, with your tax free money that you get, um, and and you go and buy that car, uh, then by all means it allow you to do that. So an annuity is just another version of a guaranteed income that you can get. It's 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 that's that's all it is. It's um, it's just another yeah. thing that you could use. Um, a classic example of that is um, on, on, a, on a defined um, benefit. Now, we're going to get a wee bit technical here. So defined benefit pensions are um, uh, are, are actually kind of similar to annuities. You work with a company and they guarantee you, you know, like Diageo or that at that time, they had defined benefit schemes. The government is defined benefit schemes. They don't do money purchase, which is, you know, you build a fund and then buy an annuity or you draw it down. Uh, yeah. The fine benefit is when you get to the end of your job, they give you two thirds of you know the forty years that you've worked um, of your of your wage as a, as an income until you until you pass away, and then they sometimes give you your spouse then half of that um, um, when you go, um, and then they get it, and then after that's done, it's it's away. Yeah. So often I think to myself, and Diageo is probably a classic example. My wife and I. Um, is we're, we're going to have to come to the conclusion because some people have actually been offered huge amounts of money to leave that pension defined benefit scheme and actually just walk away and, and put their money into a money purchase. And I'm, I'm talking about huge amounts of money. And when you work yeah. out the return, it's like, wait a minute, I'm going to get, I'm going to get what? 600,000? <laughs> Give me the money now. So I've heard like, of people getting more. Yeah, because I, because it's like, when, you work out, when you work out the defined benefit of what you were going to get, it, it made more sense actually to just take the money and run. Um, but they just didn't want an obligation. You see, that's why they were offering huge amounts um, in, in terms of in terms of to get you to leave that because they didn't want an ongoing commitment. They have to they have to guarantee as part of their as part of their accounts and the liquidity and their financial structure because um, they have to top it up every year if it drops in value. That's their obligation as employers as a, and a defined benefit. So what most people have now is money purchase. What you guys have is money purchase. Yeah. The money purchase scheme is the employer puts money in and you put money in and then it builds a fund at a period of time that when you want to draw it down, you can either do the annuity level or you can just use the money and call it off when you want it. Yeah, Makes sense? I mean, yeah, like if you, if you feel like, obviously, if you've got that lump sum, if you feel like stock markets and things are too risky, maybe at that stage in life, then you can buy an annuity for like a guaranteed annual income. Mm. If rates are good at the time, uh, it's maybe a, a good idea. But although it may... Uh, get less back than you pay in, depending on how long you live, like you say, Jim. But then, like these ones, we do as you'll pass on to your, your, other, your spouse and whatever. But that, that's different. So um, that's basically what an annuity is, Kim. Um, yeah, Penny but, had uh, people said about, you know, what happens if you draw down all your pension at once, your pension fund. If you drew your pension fund all down at once, it just mm -hmm. goes as part of your taxable income. Because remember, the tax man has been giving you all the, all the tax, tax benefits, life. you know, the tax yeah. back on top of it. Yeah. So that's the that the that's the that's the catcher. You actually think you're getting money from the tax man for nothing, but in actual fact, when you start to draw it back down, it becomes part of your taxable income. Mm -hmm. So you'll be taxed on it. So if you drew the whole hundred percent down at once, you would have to pay tax um, at the following year and your return based on that drawdown as an income. So it's it's like almost being it's like almost being investments. So it just becomes part of your normal day-to-day -day income and then taxable under your tax regime. Um, what else, Richard? Let's let's go yeah, in a bit so, more then. So um, then in comparison, obviously, like rental properties, uh, like we explained earlier, they carry on working for you uh, as yeah. long as you own them, whether you're retired or whether you're still working. Uh, and you could keep expanding your portfolio during your retirement by refinancing to release that equity. Um, yeah and fund the purchases of more properties depend and you could keep doing that over and over and it depends how much you want to obviously expand do it every single time yeah do it every single time as the value goes up um there's an opportunity to release equity in that value and get yourself a new mortgage bring some money back out put deposits on more houses and actually buy more property to actually reinvest back in so you're compounding the wealth over a period of time um but you're being realistic you know mm -hmm. the property investment business isn't there a get rich quick scheme it's a long term, a long term income drawdown over a period of time. So, in other words, you keep reinvesting, keep reinvesting. I was talking about one of the SPVs. So, an SPV is a special purpose vehicle that mm -hmm. I set up recently um, for a different buy to let strategy. So, it had to be mainstream. I have two, in my other company, I have too many um, 
uh, misnomers. In other words, I've got commercial property, I've got limited companies that are owned by that company, yeah. and the the buy to let lenders don't like that. They like clean companies. In other words, an SPV, which is specifically set up, a special purpose vehicle, specifically set up for a buy to let business, mainstream residential rent. Residential that's what they want. Yeah, because it ticks the box, and that's it. That's all they want. Computer says no. Um, so they want that sort of strategy. So that's why I've had to set that up. So I've actually put equity into that and I've actually put director's loans into that. And that's then bought a lot of properties for cash in there. And now I'm actually at the bank saying, look, I want to now finance that and bring that money back out. But when I finance that and bring that money back out, I want to buy more property of it as well. Now you'll pay a, you'll pay a small amount, but then you have to work out that again, you have to work out that strategy about how much that costs you to borrow that money. But if you're making a 10 or 15 percent return at top line in terms of your income and, and folk go, oh, you'll never make a 10 percent or 15. You're probably right. I'll probably make infinite sometimes um, but, or, or maybe 25 percent plus. But but you've got to get the strategy right. You have to understand if you get the strategy right in terms of your buy to let investments, you can do this every single time. It is a McDonald's system. Duplicate, yeah. duplicate, 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 duplicate. Every that single thing. It does not change. It does not deviate. The only thing it does change, Richard, recently, was I substituted uh, grey paint for magnolia. <laughs> yeah, I would change the decor. <laughs> <laughs> and the carpets are no longer beige. They're, they're grey. Yeah. But even making that difference has made a difference on the tenants that you're getting in because you've kept up to date with the current trends for it which means you're still attracting the tenants because you're keeping up to date with it. Higher the occupancy levels. Mm -hmm. So it's occupancy levels key here. And it's also the fact that you're attracting the right tenants, as you said, Karen, and they stay longer, but they also look after the property more because you've got it more modern. Therefore, if you respect it, they'll respect it. And you're giving them less reason to want to move because they've got a property that is more Maybe. modern, that they're happy in, that will last them longer because it is more only rather than something that's a bit dated that somebody effectively is going to niggle away at them and think i want something more modern the only reason anybody like does anything is if they see a 30 percent or more perceived difference between where they are now to where they want to go that's the only reason to move it's yeah. the classic example of the story i always tell about the the bloodhound you know lying next to the roaring fire on a cold winter's night and and the two guys are sitting watching the bloodhound and the bloodhound moves every now and again and goes oh and lets out a huge howl and, he, and and his pal goes to him what's going on there and he went oh just leave it and he went but but i'm not really. and then the next minute the, the bloodhound moves again he goes oh and it's like it's like the guy goes what's going on why is he letting out this big scream every and this big howl every now and again this bloodhound blind next to the fire surely he's bound to be he's bound to be really comfortable in terms of what he's doing and and his, his pal actually said well funny enough um he is actually quite comfortable but what happens is in the floorboard, there's a wee nail that sticks outside the outside out the floorboard now and again. And when the bloodhound moves, he kind of forgets it's there and it hits him, that nail, right in the ribs. And he lets out a big a big howl. Oh! And it's like, and it's like it says, and, 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 and but he says, why does he not move? And he said, Well, I guess he just doesn't find it that uncomfortable. You're I've never heard that before. I actually thought you were going to say he was sitting too close to the fire, but anyway. No, it, it, he just doesn't find it that uncomfortable. And that is human yeah. behaviour. Mm -hmm. If you look after somebody and there's no, there's not a 30% or more perceived difference between where they are now to where they want to go or where their circumstances, this isn't anything. They'll yeah. not do it. They'll just tolerate it. How many times have you continued to pay a higher bill on something or a standing order because you probably couldn't be bothered changing it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I see. Everybody's saying it and everybody out there will say the same thing. You just continue to pay it, don't you? Do you know what That's we spoke about this? For somebody yeah. as well. If you're looking at obviously a new first month's rent up front, you're looking at a new deposit, you're looking at moving fees, if you're having a to factor, somewhere, there you go. It is, yeah. it's it's a lot of money that it does amount up. So it, realistically with tenants, unless you've got a change of circumstances, and to me, I would only want to move if I needed a bigger property or your circumstances change with work or anything, but realistically, you don't want to move because there's a lot of cost incurred in a lot, that. A lot of upheaval yeah. and things, that, and mm -hmm. it's just not worth it. And this is why this is why many landlords view a private pension and buy to let as a perfect combination. Yeah. I mean, there's no surprise there when I talk about I've got a private pension as well. But my private pension is designed to bring me down to minimum tax. 
That's what it's designed. That's what yeah. it's there for. It's nothing else. It's no for saving for the future because I'm I've got it anyway. But it's designed to bring me back from the higher rate to the lower rate. I'm getting another tax rebate again this year for the third year in a row. <laughs> now, admittedly, I'm telling everybody out there before they start getting the pitchforks. I know. I was just going to say, you're gonna... <laughs> the pitchforks and your and your your torches out. It's like no, 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 no. I'm getting another, I'm getting a tax rebate. It's only about seven or 800 quid, but every single year I get a tax rebate because I make sure I'm in the higher rate band, so I get higher rate tax. But I then put a sizable lump sum into my pension, which is uh, allowed to be deducted against my income um, when it's calculated. Therefore, it brings me back down to lower rate. Therefore, any higher rate previously will actually be paid back to me. So that's why I make sure I'm just under that threshold every single year by putting a substantial amount into my pension in order to do that. So you can plan that perfectly well before the end of the year. And we've got loads of um, examples of that and talking about in the Wealth Creation Shows on, on our yeah. Five Properties TV channel on YouTube. So tune yeah. into that. You've got huge amounts of content there, which will tell you how to develop wealth over the over you know years and years and years to come. Timeless content for yeah. you right there. You, and people will go out and spend tens of thousands of pounds on getting this education, and it's free. It's all there laid bare for people to, to, to take advantage of. And because it's free, people just think, it can't be worth something because it's for free. That's often why a lot of people charge money for that advice. So it's free. Take advantage of it. Five Properties TV on YouTube. Yeah. And it's the Wealth Creation Shows. Um, so there's 52 episodes so far, a whole year's worth of content there yeah. for you. Um, okay, um, so we've, we've kind of gone to that. The, your money needs to grow after you retire. We know that exactly right. And, and that's where Vitalet comes in as well, because that still continues to grow and still continues to earn income. Um, and whereas your pension, if you start to draw it down, that, that, then, that then begins to spend, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... Does being a landlord buy buy you more freedom? Does it really? Well, I mean, there's always long term planning is essential uh, for future financial freedom. Um, but it's like people question, but should that mean that you have to wait until you retire to live the life that you want and have more time and have more yeah. freedom? Um, I was just thinking that the other day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. well, the de the debate ranges over instant gratification versus long term planning. Uh, yeah. But there's no reason why you can't have both um, with a mixture, uh, with a mixed investment strategy, um, whether that be, like you say, a combination of like a, a buy to let portfolio and your, your pensions and things. Um, yeah. So yeah. once you start your pension, your funds are locked away until you're at least 55. As you said, Kim, that's going to be a, a wee bit later for uh, us guys when we get and to I that. And uh, I tell you what, let me stop you there, Richard. Um, yeah. You think it's going to be a far way away, but I'm at 56 now. I could draw down my pension right now. Um, well, and I, I never, I never envisaged at your age. I thought that was light years away. Yeah, and and that's the key here. And I'm still, and I'm still fighting fit. When you look at it, right? And I'm still, I'm away up another mountain in Northern Africa in yeah. March. Mm -hmm. So, and I do triathlon as well. So it's it's at this time you kind of think to yourself, I wouldn't mind actually uh, drawing that down and, and and taking advantage of that. Here's a classic example: when you get to fifty five as well, or you get near enough fifty five, or you're at fifty five, and you know you can draw down. This is where you put huge tranches of money into your pension because if you put huge tranches in, you'll get huge tax advantages to it. And especially at a time like this when you're getting such low rates in the bank just now, if you then draw that down after two or three years and actually just, well, just actually say you're going to start to draw it down, you could put huge tranches in to your pension. Now, again, this is not financial advice. This is how I'm going to do it. You put huge tranches in the last final years that you're going to draw down your pension and you put huge tranches in, you're going to get 25% of that amount back out tax-free. Plus the fact you're going to have the tax added onto it to leave it in there to draw down when you want. You don't need to draw it down every single year. You can just draw it down when you want. So you could leave it there for for advantageous, for tax planning again. So when years when you think you're just under the ma maximum, you're, you're maybe a wee bit too much under the maximum, you know, the higher rate threshold, you say, okay, I've got, an, I've got an amount I can draw down for my pension to make that up to the, the basic rate amount just before that it kicks into the higher rate. So there's another opportunity to take advantage of that in the last final years that your pension is due to be drawn down is put huge tranches of money in in order to draw 25% out tax-free and get that huge uh, um, uplift from the government. I mean, you're getting a 20% uplift. You can't get that in a bank. No. You'll never I get that in a bank. No, definitely not. 
So look at that. That it's a, it's a great tax. I stood with somebody the other day and went, and I worked all in. I went, I'm paying a marginal tax of like seven percent a year. What? I, you're having a laugh, really? Yeah. And genuinely, if you plan right, you can pay minimal tax in terms of what you're doing. We're not evading. Remember, we're avoiding in our name, but your company has to pay it in their name anyway. So they get you whether you like it or not. Yeah, you, uh, and I wonder if we always get paid. But, yeah. but the limited company is paying it, and you're getting more in your hand for you to use. That's the more important point. You've got more for you to use to do what you need to do, but your limited company will pay just as much on the back of that. So they pay the amount and not you personally. It's just another way of being able to get money out tax efficiently um, from your limited company to you. Um, so you're paying the same amount of tax overall. So yeah, I mean, just to pitch for I, I know, just to be clear, there's there's really no way of completely evading tax. And one way or another, I'll come back around whether it's show your limited company or show your own name. Well, tax um, avoidance. When I was when I became a training accountant, two things I was two things I was told: uh, tax avoidance is okay, tax evasion is illegal. Yeah. And the other thing was, is you never, you never um, f with the in, with the customs and excise. Um, I'm not going to say the word. You never f with the customs and excise because they've got more powers than the police, and they they are they are they are the smuggler boys. They are the boys that used to run on the smugglers and ki and kill them basically for smuggling. Um, way back in the early 1700s, 1600s, they used to catch them. You know, coming from the beaches with all the you know whiskies and everything, and smuggling yeah. them in in the tunnels. Um, to, to avoid excise and duty, these people have got more power than the police. You never mess about with them, never ever. Anyway, anyway so just I back to retirement age. So obviously, the government raised that, um, are, are going to raise that to 57 uh, in yeah. 2028, and they'll raise it further uh, later on. Yeah, they'll but you know, Jim, keep going up, keep going up. You'll work until you die, unless you yeah. plan it properly. Remember, again, I come back to saying this, Richard. This is a this is a, just me going off on a wee bit of tangent. I know we we'll want yeah. to get through this, but it's important for people to realise your retirement is never age dependent. It's always about money. Yeah. Because if you had all the money in the world and you had won the lottery tomorrow and you were 25 years old, would you retire? Absolutely. You go and do what you want to do when you want to do it, anytime you want to do it, because you have the money to do it. So retirement's nothing to do with age. It's everything to do with money. Yeah. Yeah, that's quite an important uh, fact there, because people get fixated on the fact that you have to be a certain age to retire, and it's not really the case. You could retire any time if you have enough money to do that. Yeah, when I, when I um, dropped me that, Richard, I never slept for the whole night. It's like <laughs> when somebody told me that, and I went, I never even thought about that. I was yeah. so, I was so um, uh, conditioned. Fixated. And yeah, conditioned into thinking that, you know, you work for 40 years, and you're retiring two-thirds of what you couldn't afford to live on in the first place. That's what I was fixated in it. That's what the government had conditioned me into. That's what society had conditioned me into. And then somebody actually said to me, no, 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 it's everything to do with money. It's got nothing to do with age. Mm -hmm. Wow. I could retire anytime I want. Yep, just make the money and you can retire anytime you want. And that's what I did. And that's why I was managed to retire at 38, 38 year old, which is, you know, 18 years ago. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just think it's like conditioned to make you think you have to be a certain age to retire and that's very much the way that I've kind of always been brought up to think about it just from school and obviously just on the little amount of knowledge that you know because this isn't things that they teach you in school no. which really they should they should school really does, no no school doesn't want to teach you to do that no I know <laughs> school, school designs you to be a good worker aunt for someone else yeah. That's what school designs you to be. You're you're there indoctrinated into the system and conditioned in the system, and you're not going to like this, parents. You're conditioned in the system in order to in order to follow the the system, in order to work for someone else, in order to home to work, home to work, home to work, home to work, live for the weekend, home to work, home to work, home to work, live for the weekend, home to work, home to work, home to work, home to work, live for the weekend. You're on the hamster wheel for the rest of your life unless you can do something to get off of that hamster wheel, and that what I did in order to buy back my time. It was never about money. The money was there to buy my time back, to give me my freedom. That's what that was all about. Nothing to do with money. Everything to do with freedom and time. Yeah. Most most valuable commodity in the world is time. No one's ever sat, sat lay on their deathbed and thought to themselves, I wish I'd made more money. Every single person says, I wish I had more money. Yeah. I'm... I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm, I'm, do you know what? I'm reading what we're going to say next. I wish I had more time. 
That's what it is. It's the things that you wish you had done with your life or the things that you've done rather than, oh, I wish I'd had more money in the bank because you can't take it with you. I mean, pensions start to pay out after they mature. Well, buy to let gives you the rent on a day to day as your tenant moves in and it can free up other income to boost your private pension. Exactly what I just spoke about. So you're getting money every single day on buy to let, not every day, but you're making money every single day. Your wealth building every single day. And if you've got enough in your portfolio, you're literally building wealth every single hour and every single minute and second. You're, you're growing rich while you sleep. You're going to your bed and waking up wealthier in the morning just because yeah. you went to sleep. That's, that's, that is phenomenal. That is compound interest and compound wealth. So that's what buy to let does for you. Pensions, yeah, can do the same thing, but you have to wait for that to be released later on at 55 and it'll be 57 for people um, from 2028. Um, You can control the direction of your lens portfolio where your pensions and a new provider makes all the decisions about managing your funds. You can have self-managed funds where you can manage yourself. And I have that to a degree, but to be honest, for the 0.75% RP of my fund to the management, I couldn't care less. It's like, you know, for the value it works out, it's like a thousand, what, a thousand, fifteen hundred quid a year I pay to them to manage my pension fund for me and make money for me at the same time. And I get the huge up upsurge and the tax advantages I get of having a private pension, then you, it's worth its weight in gold, you know, to have that running alongside. So I think that's another most important thing for landlords, though. Part of the attraction of buy to let is the direct control it gives them while also providing a balance between planning for retirement and enjoying life now. And that's all about getting time your deed. time back now rather than later. Yeah, you're a long time deed. You're not yep. taking it with you. It's no going with you. You're not taking it with you. You can't take it to your grave. You may as well enjoy it now. And I don't mean throw everything to caution and spend all your money right now. What I'm saying to people out there is remember, you only live so long. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think my client is still profitable. This is the one that comes up every single time. We touched on this at the start, and I think it, it, you could hardly move from stories gleefully announcing the collapse of the buy to let uh, as something that no long, longer works. Uh, so why are so many landlords still successful? Um, and I think I think an important thing here as well is we we touched on it at the beginning as well is landlords who are in it for the short term gain are they are mostly the ones that are that are obviously not. Uh, or they're ex in the market at the moment because it doesn't work. It's, it's a long term thing. I think that's an important thing to remember as well. But yeah. the answer is is pretty simple. So let's take a look beyond obviously what is in the headlines and things uh, to understand what the bigger picture is. The only person um, ringing the bell and saying this is fantastic, gleefully announcing the collapse of the buy to let and how landlords are going to lose out and how the property market is going to crash is the people mm-hmm. that are skint in the first place. Yeah, they just want to see the world burn. Yeah. don't buy into their story they want to see the world burn at all cost stay away from these people they're skint for a reason mm-hmm. because they think like that okay yeah, so richard go go on it's like i'm, I'm on a mission today <laughs> <laughs> you usually are but anyway no in fact obviously like press stories and and the media and things they rarely mention that obviously buy to let income keeps increasing over time uh, rents have risen by an average of around 30 percent from like mm-hmm. 2008 uh, turning a 6% yield uh, on a property bought then into about 8% now. I mean, yeah. how could you argue with that? Uh, and being smart with how you buy and hold rental properties can significantly increase your tax allowance and profit as well. Um, and we've covered that, obviously. And, and the, 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 see the, the 8% yield as well. You know, mm-hmm. we're talking about the 8% yield now, but that's even not taking into account the appreciation of the property over time. And we always yeah. talk about yields and we talk about net yields, we talk about gross yields. Nobody ever talks about the additional increase, which is the capital appreciation. Yeah. And when you add that on, in some cases, over the last, since the beginning of the pandemic, when you add that on, in Fife, it's 30.6% in equity increase in houses on average. That's a huge amount of money yeah, in terms of equity money. increase. But equally, that could go down. So that's why we don't really talk about it as much. But I tell you what, that 30%, allows you now because you had 25 percent in there before with your equity when you bought them because you had to do that in a buy to let mortgage now you've added 30 percent on you've got 55 percent in so you can actually take out another 30 percent and actually buy more property or invest in more property on deposits Mm -hmm. and do the same over again 
and see how that works. So you're making a marginal increase in each one. You're making a marginal amount on each one. It's like the duplication process that McDonald's do. They don't make it on everybody, but they don't make it on just one thing. They make it on a whole load of combination of stuff in order to maximize their wealth and maximize their returns. And so they actually up. That's why they upsell you. You know, as soon as you walk in and say, can I have a Happy Meal? They go, do you want that large? Yeah. No. Yeah, they're wanting to upsell you. Imagine the 50 pences every single time when somebody says yes. Millions, billions around the world every mm -hmm. single time. When you think about even a million at 50 pence extra, that's 500,000 pounds just for going large, just for asking that question. I've never actually thought about that before. Yeah. You've just said it and the penny's dropped and it's like it is. It's those marginal things that all yeah. amount up. And Straight on the bottom line. Straight on the bottom yeah. line. Because when you think about it, the most cost is in the setup of, a, of an operation. So therefore, if you're adding another couple of chips, the other couple of chips is incidental because it's probably like, I don't know, pennies to yeah. make another couple of chips because they're getting made at the same time as every other one. So then you're chucking them in. You're getting another 50 pence upsell on it. So you're making that you're making huge margins on that there. This is why when you walk into um when you walk into curries and stuff like that, they then begin to sell you plans for insurance and plans for repairs because that's where they make more money than ever before than the original cost of the goods. Why do you think Nintendo sold you the base units for, for cost, if not at a loss? Or all these games companies? Because the games that they sold you, they make huge margins on. That's where they're making their money on the games and the cartridges. They're not making their money on the on the actual base units. They don't make anything on them at all. Sometimes it's what you buy after that it makes the money. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been smart on how to hold rental properties and it can increase your tax and allowances. It's exactly what you said, Richard. Yeah. Buying unmodernized homes and upgrading them to a contemporary standard standard is proven as a proven rinse and repeat formula. This creates more equity faster to expand your portfolio. Given all the above that we've just spoken about, it's perfectly possible to build a sustainable buy to let business and for one or more homes that becomes more profitable over time. But you're still not convinced. Then take a look at a previous blog that we did. It's on this link. It's yeah. called Buy, Revamp, Rent and Repeat. That's buy, Revamp, Rent and Repeat, buy, revamp, rent, repeat, buy, revamp, rent, repeat. And that's all I've done for the last 30 years. And I'm mm -hmm. still doing it today. And it compounds wealth astronomically over time. Astronomically. When you get to the bigger numbers, we talk about in the Wealth Creation Show on Monday at 12.30, by the way, tune in. Um, we talk about the bigger numbers and what you could, what, what's out to the develop. I mean, one example, Richard, you know, and, and, you're, you're talking about I've, hold, I've held some property for over, what, 25 years? Yeah, 20 years, yeah. And I bought them for 15000 I've spent a wee bit of money upgrading them over the years, but I've managed to make a top-line rent of about £90,000 on that £15,000 property. Yeah, and years. some of them are only at that point now where you're doing the full refurbs from the initial ones that you've done. Can yeah. you just done So, um, yeah. This is why buy to let is a really good avenue for people that want to supplement a pension or maybe make a wee bit additional income and reinvest for the future. There's nothing wrong with it. These idiots out there that say a home is just for living in and it shouldn't be owned by anybody, haven't the penny hasn't dropped with them. No. And the fact that the person that owns their home is the bank. And it's called a mortgage. You don't own your own home. The bank owns your home. All you're doing is you're paying the bank for the privilege of owning, of actually using that home until you pay off that mortgage. The bank has it. The bank is your landlord. Yeah, and everybody yes, doesn't yes. seem to see a problem with that. And yet the bank will be the first person to throw you out in the street if you can't pay your mortgage. And yet a landlord doesn't have that power to do that. So where do you think you should actually go if you're actually not wanting to commit to buying a property? Rental. Yeah. And you should be looking at private landlords because they're more they're an easier option because you've got more rights with a private landlord than you have at any other point in time as a tenant. Yeah. Happy days. Plus the fact you've not got the entry and exit costs of being a tenant either, of, of actually home ownership. So if you're looking for short term renting for the next two or three years, or you just don't want to commit because you're no sure where you are financially right now, renting is a really good option. And that's why that market will always exist. Mobility of labor as well. That's why the rental market will always exist. 
Social housing as well. We have to prop that market up as well because they've not built and they will never build enough houses for people in social and need social housing. And I don't mean it's anything to do with the fact that they can't afford housing. I mean they're on benefits. The government has to pay the rent because they don't have they can't they can't buy because the government has to pay the because they don't earn any money. Somebody has to house them. The private renting sector is taking up that slack or all that slack, and the government can't house because they don't have any houses because of the 69% of properties in social housing that were sold off since the 1980s and I would never replaced. No. Now do you see out there, everybody tuning in and listening in, how the buy-to-let market will continue to be extremely lucrative for years to come in the UK. We are a unique situation in how we are. We are, we are the only nation in Europe it actually have the highest proportion of home ownership. It is abnormal to the rest of Europe how, how our home ownership is so high. And it was never like that in the 1950s. The 1950s, home ownership was around about 55, home ownership was around about 45% of the UK stock. 55% of people rented their homes in the 1950s. Amazing, yeah, I mean, the, the house that I'm in at the moment, and, and you as well, Ken, we're, we're an ex-local authorities. These are... Yeah. And you can see all that. They're, all great, they're nice, authority. big, sturdy buildings rather than yeah. new builds that are damaged from the start, potentially. Yeah, but I mean, so, the, the reason we're in them is because obviously they were all sold off, like you say. Um, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, so, what security does buy to let offer then? Uh, yeah, Kevin, so, what security does buy to let offer? So, security is a massive consideration for retirement. And the, stand, and the standout feature of a buy-to-let many landlords is that the property is tangible asset that can't simply disappear overnight or ever. Yeah. So there's some factors that make a rental property a secure investment. So regardless of economic ups and downs, having a home is everyone's first priority. So no matter what situation you're in, you're, you need a roof over your head. Yeah, first and foremost, as people, as, as I need a home to live in. And I think that should be everybody's first priority, I think. Absolutely. So we, we provide homes, and that's what our job is, um, providing homes. The day the government builds enough houses, and all these naysayers out there that say it's terrible and you buy to let landlords and take all these houses, the day the government builds enough houses to accommodate all the social housing and affordable housing is the day I'm happy to leave the market. That's all. All I'm doing is providing a facility is not there just now. The government just needs to plug that hole by providing enough houses, and then we're off. We're away to do something else. So we're providing, know, that, we're providing that facility for people. Tell all the hundreds of people we house right now, all these people out there that say this is terrible and all the rest of it, people should own their own homes. Yeah, they can, but a lot of people can't own their own homes for various reasons financially. They just can't. Credit and that's it. I think you've hit the nail on the head there. There's a lot of people that are not going to be in positions to buy their own home, and yeah. where does that leave them? Because yeah. the housing market on a buy-to-let with private landlords provides such a big section of the housing market to these people Absolutely. that wouldn't be able to buy somewhere or that need the flexibility of not owning their home at that time. Because like you say, there's no entry exit fees. There's 28 days notice for them to be able yeah. to move on to a new property. So it does give a lot more flexibility than homeowning does. Yeah. So for all these people out there that think we shouldn't own homes, where are the, all these people meant to go? The hundreds of people we house, the thousands, yeah. the hundreds of thousands of people, uh, private landlords right across the whole of the UK house. Where are they meant to go? You tell me. They don't have anywhere to go. So just saying the simple thing about the fact that that's terrible, it's obscene and all the rest of it. The reality is, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll sell up completely. We'll let the banks take over corporate. Well, corporate lets. So we'll let the banks take over because this is what the government's purporting, uh, what the previous the Conservative government purported. Let the banks look after it, Barclays and that. Could you imagine how how sympathetic Barclays Bank would be to a tenant if they couldn't afford the rent? Not very. <laughs> bye bye. They'd be saying bye bye. They would make sure they would also make sure that before they went down that route, that the government put new legislation in place to protect them more than what they protect us right now as private landlords. And I'll guarantee you they've got the clout because the investment houses control the world. The government don't. The investment houses control the government. because They're the ones that have got all the money. Money, yeah. And that's the thing. While pensions are managed by highly experienced fund managers, they're also invested in stocks and shares that follow the often sudden turns of the stock market. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's so right. Um, pension funds are managed. High risk pension fund managers. You're absolutely right. Um, yeah, I would I would say that. So it, it, there is a there is a plus and minus to each one of them. Even in periods where property prices stagnate or fall, rents typically rise as buyers become tenants, uh, which increases competition and pushes up yields. You know yeah. that's that's what it is. Now remember, the yield is out there. We're we'll talking about yields and that. And to be honest, it's it's the return on investment. But the yield is out there in order to have a proper return on investment so we can reinvest in the property so to look after the tenant. After all, you know, you need a profit in order to change the boiler, in order to sort the roof, in order, and that's something that a homeowner has to do themselves, where a tenant doesn't need to do that. The landlord's obligated to do that. You know, if there's any repairs done, the landlord has to put their hand in the pocket for everything. That's why they need a profit in order to do that. Yeah. So there's nothing wrong. Again, we're coming back to there's saying... nothing wrong with making a profit because you need it to... The stigma in our society, especially in the UK, about when people say it's terrible making a profit out of housing, it's like newsflash, they've been doing it for years and the government makes a profit as well and the council makes a profit as well because they have to make a profit in order to actually reinvest back in the stock. They don't and run it as a loss. The council don't run it as a loss. They have to make money in order to make sure they pay all the wages of the people that are running the system. Housing associations have to do it as well, except they call it a surplus. Still a profit. Still a <laughs> yeah. profit. Still the same thing. Yeah. It's like got it up in a different way. It's, you know, it's still the same thing. Um, so whatever sentiment and realities of the economy, rental homes are always in demand and they're probably, uh, they're probably why the phrase safe as houses exist yeah. every single time. Let's wrap it up there. What's your final thoughts on this, Kim? To me, I think it's very much like people say knowledge is power, but in this situation, knowledge can give you an income. You could, I think it's good to have your eggs in multiple baskets when it comes yeah. to your future. So whether that's buy to let, pensions, if you can invest in a buy to let, I would highly recommend doing it. It's something that I intend to do as soon as I can. And obviously just to safeguard yourself going into the future, you have varied sources of income for it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, we, we titled today, um, obviously buy to let or pensions, I think probably um, a combination of both is probably a good option for most people, and I think a, a lot of uh, buy to let landlords are of the same uh, thought process as well. But yes, yeah, safe as houses, Jim. You, you had to on the nail with that, to be fair. Literally, I, I mean, the price, the, the, the return on investment in equity, how houses have gone up in value, is about is around about 5,400%. Uh, stock market's gone up about 3,500% in value over the years in similar circumstances when you compare like with like. So there is no comparison, but putting all your eggs in one basket is not a way to go. And you should always have some sort of, I don't really like to call it a fallback position in terms of your investments. It's just to make sure you've got a degree of comfort. Um, and that's that's another reason why I have a pension. So the pension is yeah. there. If I lost everything tomorrow, it's like, thank God I've just got a pension. I've got your pension, yeah. Yeah, I've got the pension, so it's fine. And, and it'll be minimum amount, I suppose. Um, in terms of the pension, but it's like, I'm not particularly bothered. I mean, the whole point I did buy to let in the first place was to get my time back, and I've managed to get that back, and that's what gives me that that freedom now. Um, but the more important point for me was, like, it doesn't matter how much it costs to keep the stock going. I will keep reinvesting, and I really don't take that much money out of the business, yeah. um, of the buy to let business, for that very reason. It just keeps going back in and back in and back in and, and, and investing high amounts and repairs and improvements and, and all the way through the stock. And and you see that, Richard. It's like, I don't really quibble about the fact that we need to change kitchens, we need to change bathrooms, we need to change heating systems. It's just part and parcel of what I've accepted practice about what I need to do. My overheads will run quite high, around about 30% of my top line rent every single year. And, and you know, I must say, in terms of repairs and improvements, it's a lot, it's really high in comparison to anybody else's sector. In yeah. terms of what they do, but I don't mind. It's like that's what it was there for. That's what it's there for. If you don't reinvest in your stock and you continually run it down, you'll come to a point in the future where you'll go, I've not got enough money to do everything now. Okay. Yeah, and I see a lot of people get caught like that. So if you want any more information, guys, all the information's on there. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show, Richard and Cairn. Um, uh, uh, anybody else who's got to keep this debate going, please feel free to mention or talk about it or say, ask any questions later on, um, unless you're on TikTok. <laughs> you've got the, you're on the neggies are on TikTok. 
<laughs> um, and uh, you want to see the comments they're making, but then that's what it is. They, they just open their mouth and let their belly rumble. TikTok people, you just you open your mouth and let your belly rumble, Blah. and all your verbal diarrhea comes up. Anyway, <laughs> and that's that's right. me for now. See you later. Uh, well, Thanks, Jason, show update Monday, 12 tomorrow night. Well, Patient show 12 30 on Monday. Bye bye for now. Thanks, Jim.